and this week we're going to cover Mark 12, 13 through 17. It's the Pharisees, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And I want to share with you the, the one thing that the Lord's put on my heart for this message is that give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Do not cling to the things of this dying world. Jesus is your only hope. And it should be important to you because demonic confusion requires trappings to stay attached. Jesus delivered you from their snare, so stay free. So our anchor scripture for today for this message is, it comes um, from Mark, and it's the Pharisees, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesars? And I'll read. Then they sent him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. Then they had come and they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay? Shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. So they brought it, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered and said to him, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And that was the end of the interaction. So let me set the stage. We are still in what's commonly called Holy Week. This is These are the last days of Jesus' life on earth. So what we're talking about today is it's actually still Tuesday and Jesus continues teaching in the crowded temple. Now there was an estimated 250,000 people in and around the city of Jerusalem for Passover week. So what's Passover? Well, Passover, it commemorates the story of the Israelites' exodus from ancient Egypt. It's told throughout the books of Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. So I want to give you just a brief overview of what is uh, the Exodus so you'll understand the Passover. See, the Israelites were once enslaved by the Egyptians. Um, God chose Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, but the Pharaoh refused to let him go. God sent ten plagues upon Egypt to compel Pharaoh to release the Israelites, but he continued to refuse. His heart had grown hardened. The final plague was the death of all the firstborn. God instructed the Israelites to mark their doorposts with the blood of the Lamb so that the angel of death would pass over their homes, sparing the firstborn. Now, after the tenth plague, Pharaoh finally released the Israelites, in which they fled for eventually the Promised Land. So I want to give you some of the highlights from Exodus 12, which talks about the, the Passover. I want to read from Exodus 12, 5. It says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Remember, God told them to, to sacrifice a lamb and then take the blood and put it over the doorposts. When they're talking about sacrificing this lamb without blemish, a male of the first year, that is the first fruit, the first offering, which is also Jesus. Exodus 12, 7, And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts, um, and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. What they're telling them is to be covered by the blood of the lamb, be covered by the blood of that sacrificial lamb, which ultimately, most importantly, is Jesus, who is the lamb, who the, by the blood of the lamb, by the blood of Jesus Christ, were saved. Now, Exodus 12, 13, uh, as a highlight, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. You see, the angel of death passed over the homes, covered the doorposts by the blood of the Lamb. That symbolizes what would become Jesus' blood that exempts you from spiritual death or separation from God. What I want to note is God did not say that only the Israelite homes could use the blood of the Lamb. You see, the truth is, anyone covered by the blood would live, would escape death. Even at this stage in history, we're back in the Old Testament, God is establishing His people of Israel, and He's establishing His kingdom. 
He allowed anyone covered by the blood of Lamb to receive salvation. You see, you remember last week when when he was when uh, when Jesus was talking about the the parable of the of the vine dressers, and he told that the judgment of the of the rebellious nation of Israel, that that God was going to take away their vineyard and he was going to give it to a new people, the Gentiles. You see, the kingdom of heaven was always for everyone. So when when this plague came, the tenth plague, it was not just for the homes of the Israelites. It was anybody that obeyed, was obedient, and applied the blood of the Lamb over the doorposts. They were the ones that were spared. You see, the religious elites, they failed to see this because of their hard-heartedness towards God. The Jews were not called to be God's only fruit, just His early fruit, so that others would follow. But I want to talk to you that are the first fruit. Are you the first person to receive Jesus in your family? What I want to tell you is that you're establishing a legacy that's going to live on. Amen. But let me tell you, it's now your job as the first fruit, as the early fruit in your family, to bring the rest of your family into Christ. It's not enough to say, I'm covered, I'm good. Good luck. I want to encourage you in that. So Exodus 12, 14 so this day shall be, shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast uh, to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. See, this is what Jesus is doing. He is honoring that scripture to observe the Passover. He is in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. You see, the Israelites were also commanded to commemorate their exodus from captivity. But what I want to tell you, the irony, is that they're celebrating their freedom while they're still in captivity. You see, they're captive to the Roman Empire. They're captive to rebellion against God. They're captive to rejection of their prophesied Messiah, Jesus Christ. I want to ask you, church, are you celebrating freedom while you're still in captivity? Are you still captive by them old days and them old ways? You have been set free. You have been delivered. Amen. Keep the victory by continuing to commemorate the victory that was given to you. Amen. They are commanded to go back and celebrate the Passover. I encourage you to continue to celebrate your day of deliverance by sharing your witness and sharing your testimony. You see, there's no, ex there's no exodus for Israel unless Jesus is killed. He is the Passover lamb. He is to be sacrificed for the sin of the world. There's no other way. His blood covers us from death. Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Church, there's no other way. There's no other way. So let's get into our anchor scripture for today. And I want to walk through this like we do. We go line by line. The Pharisees, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? 13 tells us, then they sent to him some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. You see, the time of engaging in low-level confrontations with Jesus is over. When they would send a couple of Pharisees or a couple of little saboteurs, and they thought they were going to trick him up on a low-level confrontation, those days are done. Those days are done. From the Sunday he rode in on the back of that coat, when they're singing Hosanna, Hosanna, the Messiah, and they're throwing their garments at the feet until Friday when they scream, crucify him. This corrupt group of elite leaders has got to change the narrative. They've got to control the narrative. You see, now they're sending in the big guns. Now the Sanhedrin are involved. When it said, then they, the they, are the Sanhedrins. They're now directing the attacks against Jesus. Let me tell you who the Sanhedrin are. Because we're going to get to see these characters, all these players, as we get further and further and move towards the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The Sanhedrin, they, they were a council. They really functioned as the Supreme Court and the legislative body over Israel. They were, this was based in Jerusalem. They had 71 members to this religious sect. Most were elders and scribes and scholars, the elite. 
They included representatives from, from say, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Like, they were, they were the cream of the crop. They knew what was best for everybody. Kind of sounds like our government today, doesn't it? They know what's best for everybody. So who are the Pharisees? We talk about the Pharisees. But they were, they were known for their strict interpretation of the Jewish law. And they also had an emphasis placed on oral traditions. They believed that, that man-made traditions were equal to the word of the Lord. Equal to the Torah. And remember, the Torah, the Hebrew, the first five books of the Bible. Or in the Greek, the Pentateuch. Pente meaning five. They, they attributed man's oral traditions with equality to the word of the Lord. Now, what I will tell you to their credit, they did believe in resurrection. They believed in an existence in the afterlife. So who are the Sadducees? A lot of times we'll say Pharisees and Sadducees, you know, when you first start going to church and, and you remember how to say those two words and it's like, well, that sounds religious. I'm going to use it a lot. So Pharisees and Sadducees. So who are the Sadducees? Because honestly, we've really not talked about them through, through this last year and plus that we've been going through the Gospel of Mark. But the Sadducees were your white collar families. Your Pharisees were your blue collars. They were your scholars. They were the, they were the guys that were maintaining the integrity of the word. But your Sadducees, they were your aristocrats, your high priests, your, your wealthy individuals. Actually, they looked down on the Pharisees. They really looked down on these blue-collar brothers that were trying their best. They got a little off course, but they were trying their best to keep the word. Now, they only accepted the written word of the law, which is the Torah. They rejected oral tradition and interpretations. They did not believe in revelation. If it wasn't written, it didn't happen. Now, I will tell you, the Sadducees, their main departure with the Pharisees, they did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in the existence of spirits or an afterlife. You can see that these two groups clashed over doctrine. They clashed over doctrine. So we'll continue, Mark 12, 13. Then they sent to him, now we know this is the Sanhedrin, the council. Then they sent to him, Jesus, some of the Pharisees and the Herodians, to catch him in his words. So we're like, oh man, you just told me about the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Now we're talking about the Herodians. Who are these characters? Well, let me give you my old school baseball card. I want you to notice the different levels of people being sent against Jesus. We deal with demonic attack all the time. Arrow after arrow after arrow that are being slung at us. And as you move closer into a transition season or closer into breakthrough, those arrows got a little hotter flame, but it don't matter because we're standing behind the shield of faith. We're armored up. But what they're doing in the natural sense is they're sending different waves of people against Jesus. Now, they got the, now they've got the Herodians involved. It's, all, it's so important that you understand everything at play in this moment. It is a complex power play by people who mistakenly uh, believe that their earthly influence gives them true authority. I will tell you, in this season, as we're moving closer to an election, I want you to understand the people at play. I want you to understand, it doesn't matter what side you're for, they don't care about you. They don't care about you. You want deliverance? You go to the Lord. You want healing? You go to the Lord. You want prosperity? You go to the Lord. Amen. Don't get wrapped up in the complexity of an earthly power play by, by people who hate each other and care nothing about you. Amen. Only the Lord. Amen. Only the Lord. So who are the Herodians? Well, let's go back to Herod the Great. They support the dynasty of Herod the Great. Do you remember who Herod the Great was? Well, he wasn't that great because he was the one, when he found out that the Messiah was born, he ordered the killing of the innocents. He ordered the killing of all the baby boys two years and younger because he wanted to eliminate Jesus. Now, his son, Herod Antipas I, this was Herod's son. This is who's in charge now. He was one of the four governors over Roman territory. He was actually assigned to Jerusalem. Do you remember who Herod Antipas was? He was the one who ordered the beheading of John the baptizer. 
See, these are the characters in play. These are the people who are sending people against Jesus. As Jesus moves towards his victorious destiny, you're going to start to see a dysfunctional hodgepodge of society. From society, from religion, from politics, from government. They're beginning to to align in a sort of a one world focus against Jesus. Has anything changed to today? Nothing's changed. But we've got the benefit of the eternal word. What I want to point out to you are different levels, different devils. As you move in your faith walk, you'll, you'll begin to encounter different devils as you mature in your faith. But part of that maturation process is that you've got the ability, the character to carry the calling and the anointing to win those, sport, those uh, spiritual wars. What I want to share with you is an equipping moment. It might feel as you're getting closer to breakthrough. It might feel like you're one step forward and ten steps back. But I will tell you that if you stand, stand, withstand the wiles of the enemy. And I've shared before, the word wiles in the Greek is two words. It's methodosos. It means one way, one path, one road. The wiles of the enemy. The enemy's only got one methodoso, one road, one path. And that's to your mind. Your mind is the spiritual battlefield. It's where your spiritual war is won. As you move closer to your breakthrough... Those spiritual attacks against your mind will amplify. But I want to tell you that victory's near. Amen. Victory's near. Jesus got to the point of such great resistance that he was physically sweating blood. No matter where, no matter how hard times were in my life, or your, have you ever physically sweat blood? But oh, the victory. The victory for Jesus was right around the corner. Sometimes in our faith walk, moving glory to glory, we're going to encounter two main types of resistance. Resistance from Satan to stop you from doing God's will and resistance from your own sin and pride. What God's doing, he's stopping you to protect you. People are like, I've been in a wilderness season for so long. Why is God punishing me? He's not punishing you. He's protecting you to prepare you to provide for you. The most cruel thing he could do is let you move into your next season and your tensile strength is not prepared to carry the weight of the calling of your next season. Do not begrudge lingering in the Lord. What I will tell you, I will share with you, that if you find yourself in a state of resistance and it's through sin or pride, simply repent and submit. James 4, 6 says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So let's continue. We're still in Mark uh, 12, 13. Then they, the Sanhedrin, said to him, some of the Pharisees and the Herodians, they sent to catch, to trap him in his words. The Sanhedrin, they sent in the special ops team. I've shared with you guys, I worked special operations for 16 years. When, and I, I was always careful the way I said, when the cops couldn't handle it, They called in us. And if we couldn't handle it, it couldn't be handled. We had a motto, if not us, who? If not us, who? If our unit could not handle that situation, there was nobody else coming. Church, I give you the same charge. If not you, who? If you do not share the gospel, if you do not... Share your witness if you do not heal and you do not deliver and you do not preach. Who? Who? This is an equipping church. We are a special forces training ground. We are raising up godly leaders for ungodly times. I need you. I want you to be prepared to be a godly leader in ungodly times. And I need you to understand If not you, who? Who's going to deliver? Who's going to heal? Who's going to prophesy? Who's going to share? So the Sanhedrin is sending in their own special operations. Matter of fact, Luke 20, 20. Let me jump over to that. This says, so they watched him and sent spies. They sent spies to pretend to be righteous. 
that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. They sent spies who pretended to be righteous. You see, in the Greek, the word to catch him, it means to trap. It's used in hunting and fishing to choose your victim. They had a thirst for his blood. And they were going to trap him in his words. Now, this is the irony that I appreciate. They're trying to, listen to this. This is how crazy the world thinks. They're trying to catch Jesus in his words. Let me drop this truth bomb. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was what? Was with God. And the word was who? God. The word the word, which is God, is what these clowns are trying to trap Jesus in. Jesus is the word. After three years of daily ministry, Jesus proved that he is the true son of God. He healed. He delivered. He raised the dead. He taught. He showed mercy. He showed uh, um, compassion. He forgave the sins and shared the gospel. He did nothing but speak in truth in all things. In past, present, and future. Proverbs 35, 6 tells us, Every word of God, every word of God proves true. He is a shield to all who come to Him for protection. Do not add to His words, or He may rebuke you and expose you as a liar. These spies are there to try to prove Jesus to be a liar. Based on His word, He is the word. This is what the demonic world will do to you if you get caught up in, in arguments that are not Scripture-based. If you allow yourselves to be soul-led, your emotions to get wrapped up. Well, I feel like you're da-da-da. How about you save that? Why don't you share the Word of the Lord? Why don't you share, be led by the Spirit? Be led by the Spirit. It will either end that argument or it'll elevate it to a kingdom perspective. Remember, we weren't sent here to win arguments. We were sent here to win souls. Amen. And if not you, who? So let's continue. Mark 12, 14. When they had come, they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and care about no one, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God and truth. They had come. Don't miss this. When you read the Bible, come into it like an investigator. They had come. Do you see what's happening? These are people that are used to people coming to them. Yeah. This is what happened last week when it said that the elites came to Jesus. What I will tell you, everybody will come to Jesus. Everybody will come before Jesus. Yeah. They don't even realize that they are fulfilling a prophetic act. Like these are next level threats. These are the spies, the special operations operatives, the saboteurs who are going to trap Jesus in his own words. Yet they came to Jesus. We will all come before Jesus. We will all stand before the throne. The Bible literally plays out every day in our lives. And sometimes we don't even realize it. When it says, when they said, you do not regard the person of men. Now, they're not saying that Jesus is rude. They recognize that Jesus does not concern himself with man's opinion. He only cares for the truth. He only cares for the truth. Like God does not play favorites. The free offer of the gospel is available to all. Amen. To the Jew and to the Gentile alike. Acts 10.34 tells us, then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. The word of the Lord is meant for all of us. And the word of the Lord is meant for all of us to share. Amen. Church, if not us, who? So they continue. They say, teach the way of God and truth. Remember, the word, um, the way in the Greek is hodos. It is a road. It is a conveyance to get from here to there. Hodos, road, way, path, also means Christian lifestyle. It is a system of doctrine, the way of Christian faith. You see, these leaders, they acknowledge that Jesus is teaching the way. The way. 
but they reject him as the path to God. Now we know there's only one path. John 14, 6 tells us this. Jesus said to him, I am the what? The way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the beauty of looking at every word in the word. It is that important. So they're admitting that you are the way, you are the path, you are the doctrine that leads to God. Yet they reject him. It's like, I know 67 will get me to Midlothian, but I don't want to take 67. Well, then you're not going to get to where you're going. You see, a few days earlier, the multitudes, they were crying out, Hosanna. They were throwing their garments on the road. They were opening themselves up to Jesus. They were giving him everything they owned. Remember, these were travelers. They trusted because Jesus was all they needed. So now, you see, the leaders, they've got to switch that Hosanna to crucify. They've got to, they've got to change the narrative. So what they do, they're going, to, they're going to up the intensity of the attacks. They're going to keep sending the more skilled saboteurs. Like they cannot let this Passover week going without Jesus fulfilling his destiny, although they're not aware that it's his destiny, that he become the Passover lamb. See, sometimes it takes a little push to redirect people. But these are master manipulators, and they're skilled at shaping and controlling the narrative. Does it sound like today's mainstream media? Be careful of what you let fill your mind. Be careful of the information that you receive as the gospel message. Only the gospel message is the gospel message. Be careful. Be discerning. Be wise in what you let fill your head. I would suggest Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. But renew your mind by the daily reading of the word. Amen. Read God's word. Yes. Renew your mind. Yes. And now, these spies think, you see, these, these spies are so good at manipulating the natural atmosphere. They think, well, we buttered Jesus up. We buttered him up. Like, you teach the truth. You're good. They called him teacher, master. They've given him false, flowery praise. But now they're going to spring the trout. Now they're going to spring the trap. Mark 12, 14. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, Jesus, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. You see, in the Greek, when these guys are talking, they're saying, Is it lawful? They didn't say, uh, How do you feel about taxes? What you feeling? You going to get a little rebate this year? A little turbo tax? No, no, no. They're asking him, is it lawful? Is it permitted? Is it uh, permissible? And then when I use the word to pay taxes in the Greek, it means to pay tribute, to consecrate, to devote, to offer and sacrifice. Caesar was considered a god, a very lowercase g. So tax paid was more of a tribute of worship than a financial transaction. And when Jesus says their hypocrisy, the Greek is an overacting, overacting personification. You're fake. It implies arrogance and hardness of heart. You know, it's interesting. Uh, part of that group, Greek word, part of the root is hypocrites. And that's a form of the word. And it actually means an actor. Because the actors wore masks. They pretended to be somebody else that they weren't. They said things that were given to them in a script, and they were usually paid to play that role. So the word hypocrite originally came from the word actor. And then what it did over time, it extended to politicians and anyone who is a moral or religious pretender, somebody that lacks sincerity and genuineness. Remember we talked about when Jesus cursed the fig tree. I told you, back in that type, in that region, the tree grew, it produced figs. Then it produced the leaves. So when Jesus saw the tree from afar and he saw the leaves, he had legal authority to believe that it had produced figs. 
because the figs come before. What he found out is that there was no spiritual fruit on that tree. That tree was faking spiritual fruit. It was false. It was a hypocrite. So he cursed it. What I've shared, be careful of people in the body who are all leaves and no fruit. In Texas, we call it all hat, no cattle. Be careful in the body of people who present themselves as having spiritual fruit when all they've got are withering leaves. Those are the hypocrites. Remember, Luke called them spies. Spies are actors pretending to be someone that they're not. Mark 12, 15, Jesus says, why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. Test me in the Greek, pierzo. It means to make proof or trial or subject to trial. Jesus is foreshadowing. Jesus knows he's going to be tried on trumped up charges, but he's going to be tried. Fake justice. But he's asking them now. He's giving them an opportunity. Why are you trying me? And it's totally, they're totally oblivious to the foreshadowing question. Mark 12, 16. So they brought it, the coin, and he said to them, whose image and inscription is this? And they said, it's him, Caesar. You see, remember, they're in the temple. They are in the temple. Place in context is important. These religious leaders are carrying a coin with an engraved image of a false god. Caesar. How do we know this? Well, these religious leaders, they're so locked into the law. They're so pious in the law. The Torah. Well, let me tell you what the Torah says. Exodus 23, 5. You shall have no other God before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image with any likeness of anything that is heaven above or that is in earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. What did they do to Caesar? They bowed down to Caesar. They served Caesar. They carry an engraven idol of Caesar. And they're standing in the house of the Lord. They're so blinded by their rebellious sin nature that they fail to see the hypocrisy in what they do. Church, I challenge us not to get locked into that same sense of hypocrisy. Not to get locked into the same sense of hypocrisy. To get a little too proud to pat ourselves on the back that we show up on Sundays. But Monday through Saturday, we're not sharing the gospel. Church, if not us, who? If not us, who? Mark 12, 17. And Jesus answered and said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. You see, this demonic culture, it wants to, it wants to lure you in with accusations and baited questions. There's no exit ramp off the freeway of rebellion. This demonic world, their job is to keep you so focused on these false allegations and misinterpretations that you take your eyes off the cross. What I will tell you again is that we're not here to win arguments. We're called to win souls. So Jesus tells them, render to, render to Caesar. The earthly government, the earthly government, they do have legal authority to function because God establishes them. We know this because Romans uh, 13, 1 through 2 tells us respect for authority. Everyone must submit to governing authorities for all authority comes from God and those in position of authority have been placed there by God. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. What I will tell you is that God sets up governing authorities. So we say, well, <clears throat> my goodness, <laughs> seriously? I mean, look at the condition of the world right now. You mean God sets that up? What I will tell you is that Romans 8.28 tells us what? That for those who love God and call upon Him, that all things work for the good of God. I will tell you that not, th not all things are good, but all things will work far good. Amen. But I will tell you that God is in control. That's right. 
It's important to note that earthly or government authority is not absolute power. Only God's word is absolute. Because the government says it's okay does not mean it is in accordance with God's will. You have got to weigh what this world tells you is okay versus what the word of the Lord says is okay. And then Jesus says, render to God. Mark 12, 17, finished. And to God, the things that are God's. Jesus establishes that there's two distinct authorities that God's people must navigate. There's an earthly authority and there's a heavenly authority. You see, while that denarius, that coin, it might be significant. It might be significant to the Roman world. The believer understands that all things belong to God. Even the non-believers who are testing Jesus belong to God. What Jesus is doing, he's putting it into perspective. Hey, y'all, if that penny is so important to Caesar, give it to him. Give it to him. But to God, give things to God. You see, that means everything, including that coin, including Caesar, including Rome, including the earth, everything. Psalm 24, 1 tells us, the earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And everything in it. <clears throat> Excuse me. What I want to share with you, I've told you before, I'm from deep south on the bayous, uh, the bayous of south Louisiana. And down there, the, 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 the old mamas, they put away, they call it mad money. And down there, they still have uh, peat moss mattresses. They stuff their mattress in their pillows of peat moss. And what they do is they hide a little bit of money in a the, in the mattress. They're mad money. They want to go shopping or they want to go to the French Quarter or whatever they want to do. You see, even that little bit of mad money that you think you've hidden back in the corner of your mattress, that belongs to God. Right. It belongs to God. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to Him. So how important is that coin in the big picture of things? Go ahead, give it to Caesar. This is why we're called to keep our eyes on the things above. And we'll start to wrap up, Kurt. Uh, Mark 12, 17, and they marveled at him. In the Greek, it's the thaumazo, to wonder, to be utterly amazed. <clears throat> We can assume that the they that Mark is talking about is referring to the ones the Sanhedrin sent. The they are the Pharisees and the Herodians. They marveled at him. You see, now that they're amazed at Jesus, they have a choice to make. They know that he's true. They know that he's the hodos. He's the way. He's the path. And they've got a choice to make. Do they receive his word as the truth? Or do they continue in re to rebel against God by rejecting his son? You see, church, we have the same choice. We have the same choice. Non-believers, when presented with the gospel, they can accept or reject Christ. It's our job to plant the seeds. Paul tells us some will plant, some will water, but only God brings the increase. If you've been witnessing and you've been sharing and you've been praying and you feel like it's falling on hard ground, don't stop. Don't stop. Non-believers get the same option as these religious elites did. Now, for believers, when presented with the, the scriptural truths that are there to transform our minds, we can either receive the correction or dig deeper into the patterns of a dark and demonic world. When the Lord tells you who, who he tells you that you are, you can receive who he tells you that you are and begin to walk in the victory of who you are. Or you can call 10 friends and post on Facebook and see who they think you should be. What I would suggest is that you stick to who God says you are. You let God be who God says he is and you be who God says you are. And I will tell you, you will walk in freedom and you will walk in deliverance and you will walk in healing and you will walk in power and you will walk in authority. You will have the exousia. Remember, that is the, the legal authority. The legal authority that God gives you to operate as he's commissioned you to operate. You are ambassadors. You are delegates for the kingdom. So you can receive the truth of Scripture 
Or as a believer, we can continue to, to reject it and keep falling into the patterns of a dark and demonic world. What I will share is that the choice is always ours. So choose wisely. So I want to wrap up the one thing that the Lord had put on my heart. The one thing that I, would, I want you to carry this week and pray about is give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Do not cling to the things of this dying world. Jesus is your only hope. He is your only hope. If we will stand together as the body and we will, we will close out this time of celebration, I will ask you, if you would, if, you'd, if you would close your eyes. And again, this is not to be magical or traditional. It's not because I read it in a Facebook post on how to be a good pastor. What I want, I want to create space for you and the Holy Spirit. I don't want you to be distracted by what's going on to the left or the right. This is a wonderful opportunity. It may be your last opportunity today to create a place of peace between you and the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to, I want to extend this invitation. If you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior, I invite you to make that decision today. You are welcome to come to the altar to make a public profession. Our elders will receive you and pray for you. You can, you can meet with one of the elders or myself or one of our spiritual mothers and fathers following the service. But, but however you choose to make that decision, make that decision today. Make that decision today. So Lord, Father, we thank you. We praise you. We are so grateful that we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. We are so grateful to have the 100% righteousness of God through the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Father, we're so grateful for the corporate move of the Holy Spirit when a body of believers do not forsake gathering, when they make the rational decision to be together as the body of Christ. I am so thankful, Father, that the body ministers to one again, one another as the body of Christ unified. So, Lord, I thank you for this message I thank you for allowing us to continue to walk side by side with your son as he moves closer to Friday. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, I thank you for this body. I pray special provision over this body. I pray that you, that you release compassion and power and understanding that you increase their faith through the transformation of their minds and hearing the word of the Lord. I pray that this body picks up the mantle as an equipped Ephesians 4, 11, 12 church, a five-fold ministry church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I pray that this church receives the mantle of godly leadership in ungodly times. And Lord, I pray that this church receives the prompting to understand, if not us, who? If not us, who? So Lord, I pray for this body. I pray to hear about the, the testimony of deliverances and healings and salvations and miracles, all preached by them in Jesus' name. So Lord, we love you. We praise you. Lord, we honor you. Mm. Lord, we're crazy about you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.